Okay, just doing a quick check, guys. So I think that's uh, uh, readable, guys. Can you hear me? See the slides? Everything okay, is it? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, good, yeah. Okay. So in, in, the, in the spirit of project management, I've allowed the one minute's grace. Uh, sometimes it's five minutes in the real world, but I think it's, it becomes one minute virtually because nobody can say they were stuck in, in Dublin traffic. Okay, so let's, let's get stuck in. Um, so maybe I'll just introduce myself uh, first, just in terms of my own background. So uh, I started as a project planner uh, almost 25 years ago, uh, working for Pfizer. Um, and I went on to work for maybe about 250 different organizations across the world as a PM mainly working in engineering infrastructure projects, but also in a totally different field in a lot of pharmaceutical, uh, a lot of it in, I suppose, fitting out of, um, of, of factories, that type of stuff. But I've also uh, as much been involved in the practical end, end of project management. I, I currently head up the uh, Masters in Project Management at TU Dublin. Uh, I've worked across a number of universities as well. And I've worked with Engineers Ireland for, uh, believe it or not, uh, almost 25 years, I think. It is certainly somewhere over 20. Um, and I suppose, uh, probably like a lot of you, I, I'm adjusting. I, I, I'd love to say I have all the answers for working remotely or working in project teams. I certainly don't. But I can certainly share with you some insights. Um, and I think sometimes the biggest problem as project managers is we tend to look down and forward. We don't look up and around. So part of this, I want to not just look at it from a tactical or operational point of view, but also look at it from a strategic point of view. Um, if you actually think about what has happened in terms of what we're really seeing here with this kind of move to online is actually, if you look a little bit beyond it, sort of take a more global perspective, there are a series of mega trends that are happening around the world. So you have a shift in economic power. You're seeing the economies of China, India becoming far more powerful. You're seeing massive rapid urbanization. So when you look at the likes of the population challenges, housing challenges in Dublin, that's actually part of a mega trend. You're seeing kind of Ireland as a small country, you know, a, a micro reflection of what's happening around the world. So we're all we're seeing this massive urbanization. Uh, tenfold though it when did the last happen in the industrial revolution we're seeing it really moving at tenfold and then you have the whole kind of issue of climate change and we have technology massive kind of ch climate change you know switching from uh, uh, the internal combustion engine to batteries massive inf influence on te technology etc and these are certainly big changes that we are seeing uh, in terms of what's out there but part of it is to understand is the impact that these changes have had is that we're actually seeing now that organizations are not surviving. So you, if you went back 50 years ago or 70 years ago, the average company had a lifespan of about 70 years. We're now looking at that at about 15 years and it's actually reducing all the time. And I suppose part of the challenges we have to understand is that if you don't change or you don't adapt, you become redundant very quickly. And there are examples of that throughout history. <clears throat> So perhaps part of that is a challenge that we're seeing now where we're going to see these, um, these big changes that are actually happening here. Yeah. Um, but also it may not be as challenging as we think. I think there's a little bit of scaremongering in this kind of that we're all going to become remote working. I certainly don't see that happening. If you look at the most jobs in the world, 50% of them simply cannot be done from home. And in the construction engineering space, that's actually much higher. There are also examples when you look at that throughout where these things have happened before. The very previous pandemics, the flu, 9-11, the anthrax attacks, uh, the uh, earthquake in Sydney. There, this has all happened before, whereby people have actually kind of left the office, they work from home. But in every single case, we, they've gone through massive change, but it's gone back to exactly the way that it was before. I don't think that's going to happen 100% this time, but this kind of belief that everyone's going to start working from home in the future, I don't think that is actually the case. I think we're going to see a, a mild adjustment rather than this dramatic adjustment that people are, are expecting. So the other thing I think that in project management, and you know, whether we're managing a team remotely or we're managing a, you know, a team in the office as such or on site, 
many of the challenges are the same. One thing we're finding actually that is a massive issue in project management now, we're seeing a new role that of a project analyst and really it's about data-driven decision-making. <clears throat> so more and more, you're required to show kind of a set of dashboards and um, you know, resource-driven critical path, that type of stuff, impact, what if analysis, how to fast track a project. And when you look at that, what we're actually seeing now is the need for digital systems and project management, whether you're doing that remotely or you're doing it on site. And just to give you an idea, if you went back again 15 years ago, the four biggest companies were in the world were GE, Exxon, Mobile, Pfizer, Citigroup. And now if you look at it, the four most successful organizations in the world all have a digital platform and are built on the digital platform. So certainly the remote management of project teams does require us to, um, I suppose, do things a little bit differently, but it also requires us to stick to the knitting and maybe to focus on the things that have always been a challenge in project management. I think it's kind of, this kind of quote sums it up, which we've all seen it. You know, it's our ability to adapt to change, but also recognize that not everything has to change in project management. I think that's a big, big sort of issue that we're going to have to understand. So that's kind of taking a global look at it. Let's take a look now more into the specifics and the kind of universals of project management. So one thing I have found in every industry sector, engineering, construction, pharma, education, there is always a friction between strategy and execution. Every organization is great at coming up with strategic plans, very good at creating projects, starting projects, not so good at finishing them. So there's that friction. The second issue is around the, the distinction between project management and change management. So what is actually happening at the moment is as much a project management, maybe the whole IT systems, et cetera, developing new processes, they are definitely projects, but the whole people side of things is change management. And what we're seeing more and more as organizations sort of recognize project management, but sometimes they're actually not so good at change management. The strange thing though is when you talk to a senior leadership team in an organization, if you talk about project management, most of them switch off. It's not in the typical MBA's mindset to think about project management. But if you talk about innovation, strategy, continuous improvement, uh, they get all that stuff. So one of the things I have found is that when you talk to senior leaders, you actually, you, I talk about change management as opposed to project management, and they seem to get that. So I think organizations still haven't gotten the importance of project management. Third point I'd make there <clears throat> is around traditional PM. It has to change. The whole idea, if you think about the engineering construction sector, we have this PMBOK, a 900 page document, and most project management processes we have in our organizations have evolved from PMBOK, and I think project management is different. Uh, today, that, that, that was built for, <clears throat> you know, a, a very linear approach to project management that hadn't changed in, in 25 years. But I think things are dramatically today, you're seeing the whole advent of agile, lean, continuous improvement, more, more hybrid methodologies. Standard methodology is very important, but it's no longer enough. You need to have more innovative and powered practices. The idea of getting uh, you know, waiting for decisions. People on sites, people on the ground need to be empowered to make real decisions in real time. And probably the biggest issue of all, and we're good, the only difference is this discussion is moving online, is there are always more projects than resources in an organization. So we're very good at, again, pumping projects into the pipeline, not so good at actually finishing them, not so good at looking at the resource demands. And you actually find in some organizations, they actually have more project initiatives than they have actually even people within it. So sometimes you'll find an organization that has 50 employees, but when you look at every little continuous improvement initiative, et cetera, they have far more than those. And I suppose it's back to that principle that remember all it takes to start a project is a kickoff meeting, that's all it takes, but delivering a project and there's no value until it's delivered is, is, is obviously a much bigger issue. Another way you could probably look at this that again, whether it's remote or you're on site, the three pillars of PM capability are always around people, you know, your people, your processes, and your ability to prioritize projects or prioritize activities within it. So these building blocks have not actually changed, even though we've re removed online. However, we have moved online, <clears throat> and I think we've got to understand this, that this is not normal remote project management. This is not normal uh, remote working. It is not 
Now, this is not normal in terms of what we're going through. And there are four reasons for that. Number one, children, whatever about the issue of, of working from home, the idea of actually working with children in the house, I think is very, very different. And, you know, really in many respects, children are a, are a productivity disaster in terms of the challenges that are out there. So that's certainly one. In terms of office space, can everyone see my slides okay, guys? Can they? Yeah. Okay. So they just said flick there for a minute. Is yeah. the full slide up or is the, do you have the full slide or? Yeah, full slide. Okay, great. Slides are fine. Okay, super. So the so I think children are kind of a major issue in terms of the of the disaster as such. And the other thing is space. If you think about it, <clears throat> the whole area of just the, the office space people have that, you know, if you're living in, in an apartment in Dublin, uh, you know, the, the chances on you having a spare room as a home office or something like that is, is highly unlikely. The shock factor. So if you actually think about this, that this really sort of happened in a, ma in a matter of hours, really, there was an announcement made. And in some cases, you know, people might have been on site and they never even got to go back to the office. So there's a shock factor. And the fourth, probably equally important, is this is not a choice. People have not chosen. Lot, there are lots of people out there who are enjoying working from home and there are lots of people who find it a complete disaster and they can't wait to go back into the office. So I think we need to understand is that <clears throat> we don't really have a roadmap for this, that, you know, initially we were feeling in the dark. We were sort of, you know, it was trial by error. And, and I suppose part of this too, in some sectors and in some organizations, you have that fear factor. You know, if you're running a project meeting and you know, maybe you're in a senior position or maybe it's your, you own the business. So you may be thinking purely of focusing on project success, but some of your staff are simply looking at you and really all they're thinking about is, am I gonna lose my job or what impact does this have me? So, and we can't really just say it's all going to be okay. There's a certain vulnerability in this. Again, look at what's going to happen in terms of all these capital projects that the government have proposed. <clears throat> are they going to be, are, you know, are they going to be shelved, etc.? And if you think about it, like in terms of the level, we now have, you know, probably three billion people around the world who are either working from home or now on government subsidy that weren't three months ago or two months ago, even in fact. So that's a massive um, challenge. So it's it's very different. You can't treat this as normal remote working from home. And I think you have to be very cognizant of that, especially if you're a team leader, if you're somebody with any sort of management or senior leadership position in the organization. However, having said that, what I think is very important is also to acknowledge that we are two months down the road in this. So really at this stage, you know, as highly disruptive as it has been, you know, we've actually, if you think about it, we've finally realized there is actually a giant off switch for the global economy. Uh, but we're also actually finding that it's too big to fail. And regardless, you look at the likes of the US, regardless of how bad the pandemic is there, people are simply going back to work. It's almost, and I think, you know, it's only going to be slightly different in engineering and construction. I think, you know, on, on Tuesday, you're going to see a moving back into work. Uh, people simply can't work from home. There's a whole range of weather issues, et cetera. And, I think we kind of have to now really at this stage also though recognize we're two months down the road, we've moved beyond the initial shock. Really your organization at this stage should have moved beyond crisis mode in terms of your IT systems. And likewise, individuals in those organizations should have moved way beyond this mantra of, oh, I find it hard to get focused. So I mean, really 40 working days into this, we should have adjusted to that change. However, while I don't think it's acceptable for people to be saying they can't get focused, I think it is perfectly okay for people to say that they're isolated or frustrated, and that's something very different. Project management is all about change and, and never letting a crisis go to waste and really capturing lessons learned. So what I would be saying to you guys that if you're in a senior leadership position or even if you're simply managing a very small team in a big organization or whether you're running a small business, trends have now emerged. You can see trends. You can see the capability gaps within your organization, whether that's around technology or your inability to get on site, whatever the case may be. Middle to large side organizations are probably going to need in their projects to set up new metrics and milestones to analyze performance. So if you have a very small team, it's probably okay to manage online, but if you're a very large uh, you know, consulting organization with hundreds of people or maybe thousands of people around the globe, 
your, your existing systems are probably not fit for purpose and you're going to have to change those. And I suppose that requires a uh, senior leadership teams, HR to, you know, be honest now and ask the question, you know, what work practices and policies do we have that, that are no, no longer helpful? Uh, what do we need to do that we haven't actually set up yet? And possibly too, you will need to reno re renegotiate contracts with a whole range of customers, suppliers. Um, and I think that's, but it has to be done. And I think it's very important at this stage that we take a more strategic medium to long-term view. Yes, things are gonna change, but it's going to be more hybrid working as opposed to, um, you know, everyone working from home. It's just physically impossible for that to happen in engineering and construction. Now, the other principle that we know about project management is while everything changes, your customers' expect, expectations are still there. They still have a project that has to be delivered. And I think it's really important that while all of this is going on, when you're conducting project meetings, you keep the focus on finishing the project. What is the next milestone? You know, what do we need to be focusing on? And that's a really important issue to, to be look at that. It is not business as usual, uh, but we still need to continue. We need to be productive. You know, meetings are going to be different. Project management is going to be different. The team dynamic is going to be different. But that doesn't mean you can't be really productive, productive in making this happen. And if you actually think as project managers, part of our role is to help people implement change. And so we should be better equipped in lots of sectors to actually go about doing this. The other thing that I think is a firm believer, sometimes when these things happen, while we get into a whole big panic mode, sometimes what we have to do is almost kind of stick to the knitting and keep the focus on where it is. And one of the things I'm a big believer in is that sort of simple resource driven critical path schedule so a dynamic schedule where you can actually do a what if analysis which a lot of organizations are doing so yesterday afternoon i was chatting with a, a, um, a an irish team who were involved in data centers and wind farms and really what they their whole challenge was yes they're all working remotely but the the client still actually wanted things delivered on the same date so really what they were looking at is doing a what-if analysis, how to crash their schedule, how to fast-track the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the client's need. And if you think about it, there are certain organizations that you know, financially they've had a major impact, but there are other organizations that have actually done very well out of this. So there is still money out there. And um, the concern I would have maybe is there are some organizations who've had a massive peak that's going to drop off again. Uh, the likes of maybe courier companies, the Amazons, the Zooms, the, these sort of organizations. I think this is a temporary peak. But in terms of, there are lots of organizations who still have plenty of money and it has an impact. And what they actually have is they have money now to accelerate the projects. And part of that is you need to be able to go back and tell those clients, you know, we can, we, you know, there is a way of delivering your project still on time, but it's going to cost that has additional risk, et cetera. And there certainly are people out there who still are able to pay for that. And I think you, you need to be ready to show them that you, you, know, you have that PM capability. The other thing about that too, if you simply have a standard, good old fashioned project management 101 Gantt chart, and it, you know, it clearly has the work to be done, it has the people who are gonna do it, and it has the deadline to, to be hit. And if you actually think about it, 80% of what we do at project management is about almost that sort of simplicity of, 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 of sticking to the knitting and just moving the project forward. However, the other thing too is that we are not in the same boat. So while you're trying to run your project as normal, I think you have to recognize that while it gives the illusion we are all in the same boat, very often it's not. So if you have people working down the country in some parts of rural Ireland, they have a horrendous broadband, they simply can't turn on the video, etc. But then you also, again, as we said, we have people in Dublin, maybe young children in, the, in, in an apartment, et cetera. So it is actually very different. Um, but I think we also have to kind of recognize that you can't let the crisis go to waste. And part of this is coming out of it in a more, as a more resilient organization along the way. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the cost of this, if an organization is to sort of embrace this to a higher level, if you look at the sort of cost model there that I have, so you can see the idea that at the moment, you've kind of had a flat cost, you've probably had a peak. <clears throat> Electrical sales of equipment have just gone through the roof, people buying additional monitors, uh, maybe office furniture, et cetera. 
But there is also, especially if we come into um, a recession, which is, is, is certainly possible, or a downward curve, people talk about a V. I was chatting to somebody in one of my diplomas in project management the other evening, and he said to me he reckons it's going to be an L curve, and it's probably realistic that it's going to be much more slower where things will wrap up again. But part of this opportunity here is to take you know, a rationalization in terms of your operating model and, and see where you can reduce costs. So certainly, even in my own case as, a, as an individual consultant uh, working from home, certainly I've had to you know, spend uh, some money on equipment and software, et cetera, but I am saving 100 euros a week on diesel in terms of driving around the country, et cetera. So there are, there are kind of savings in that. And again, to do that on an individual basis is very easy. Do that across a team or across an organization, it becomes very complex, but I think it's something we are going to have to look at within these organizations. Now, so the other thing then is, I think in terms of running your meetings online, I think it's really important you come back to basics. So this is actually one of your, uh, your members, uh, JP Hillert, he gave a, he gave a presentation to uh, an online diploma and PM I was running. And I just thought that, you know, people actually forget how important meetings are in projects. So if you actually look there, you know, I just, again, very quickly, I don't want to read all this out, but, you know, it's a massive issue in terms of communications. It's a way we engage with stakeholders. It's, a, it's probably the most important communication vehicle in terms of your wider project team, et cetera. And very importantly, it's how we give direction to projects uh, and how we get actions and decisions and very and equally important how we record this. And I think that's a big issue online in terms of how, how we record meetings, et cetera, in that space. Now, the other thing too is he showed me a charter he had for, for his meetings. And I think this could be something you could adapt something like this for online meetings to define you know, what there are certain meetings that potentially you will have every day and you might have an end of week meeting, you might have an end of month meeting. But I think you need to go back and kind of almost, in a, and, and simplicity is the key here, but just clarify what is the purpose of the meeting and how often it should occur. And I think part of that too is just a way of actually keeping structure within the organization in terms of how we do that. So now the other thing too is though we have to acknowledge is remote teams do fail and they fail for two reasons. And one of them is the whole area of the ineffective communication. Quick look here. Uh, Okay, great. Some people are putting up uh, notes, et cetera. Very good. I won't be able to keep an eye on them. That's great to see those comments. I'm sure Elva will share those as we progress. So I, I think we need to understand that, you know, as wonderful as it all sounds as well in remote teams, that they do fail. And the two big issues are ineffective communication and ineffective remote culture. So communication and culture are very different uh, when, you do them when you do them remotely. The whole people interaction, the face-to-face, -face, the actual banter that happens within project teams and even with clients is actually really important for project success. I always think when I work in a project that you know, you've sort of two options to laugh or cry. Generally, we tend to laugh in engineering construction. We tend to get on it. There's a bit of camaraderie in project teams, but it's actually very difficult to re replicate that dynamic online. So you do get a lot of people here, people talking about this mental health crisis is coming etc. Um, and I suppose, you know, you've got to kind of think about, you know, your remote company culture, you're going to need a whole uh, new set of tools. I think it's really important that I often talk about looking people in the white of their eyes. I think that's very important, whether you're in teaching, you're in project management, you're in people management. And I think you know, that's really important. And if you think about it in engineering construction, in the last two months, we've probably seen 10 years of digital transformation in terms of what's happening out there. So things that I have seen is where somebody is going on site, they now have a camera strapped to their helmet and it's actually connected to the phone and they're actually broadcasting back to everybody's screen and they're actually looking at sites. So there is amazing things that are still going out there uh, despite of what's going on. So the next thing then is face-to-face -face communication. It does matter. So like it is definitely the most effective way of communicating with people. So if you kind of see some of the points there, is it actually sort of ignites or triggers your brain in a way that, that nothing else can. And the same idea to one-to-one -to -one meetings. So, you know, just sometimes having a chat or a cup of coffee with somebody on a one-to-one, -one, 
either within the organization or a friend of yours who's discussing maybe a, a difficult issue in work. Um, I think those things are very important and we have to try and replicate some of those sort of subcultures online. And something we're incredibly good at in Ireland is the banter, the, the small talk. You need to be very careful that you don't, your online meetings just become work, become a bit ro robotic in terms of how we do that. So somewhere along the way, you know, the whole area of empathy, the, the, you know, empathy in, in dealing with people has to come into focus here as well. You know, we can't really just talk about the work. Um, you know, and I think that's a massive behavioral change. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have found too that I think when you're having online meetings, you do get this sort of Zoom fatigue. I know if I'm teaching online for two hours, I find it uh, as draining as a full day teaching. It's just incredibly intense, um, the online dynamic. Now, one thing I think is absolutely essential for a remote team is a daily huddle or a stand-up, almost your toolbox talk in engineering construction. And I think you actually, this is something you have to be super ruthless about for everyone's benefit. And in terms of your daily stand-up or huddle, and a lot of people talk about having them, you know, at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. My own view is actually, I think it's much better to do it maybe around 12.30 or something like that in the day. If people have, have young children or they've commitments in the morning, maybe you know, calling, checking an old or people, et cetera. I, I'm not a big believer doing a first thing in the morning in the current climate. In a normal work environment, kids have gone out to school, so great to do it, but not now. So I think around 12.30. And the reason I like to suggest 12.30, there is also a chance, which is a good thing, that people actually might say, well, look, I'm going to get a sandwich, stay in line, we'll have a chat. And you, they just start to talk about the human elements. Now, in terms of those work stand-up meeting goes, absolutely essential is what I call camera readiness. This business of somebody going on to an online meeting in a project team and they have their camera uh, you know, muted and they have their microphone muted, that is a complete waste of time. I think you're actually better off you know, focusing on making your project team smaller. Just you know, take those people off it. Now, I'm not saying every single time somebody might have some issue or something in, but like, you can blur out your background. There's a whole range of things you can do. And I even see it when I'm, when I'm teaching. Some people every week, they're, uh, they come in and they, they, they have their mic muted and they have their video camera muted. And probably in the class I'm teaching of about 35 and that uh, uh, PM diploma, um, they're, they're, you know, there's probably the same two or three. And I actually realize, you know, now when I look back, I should have set that as a ground rule that you have to have your camera turned on uh, and what actually happens is they lose more than anyone from it. So there's no way you're going to be engaged in a project team. So I call it, you have to be camera ready, which is your webcam on and your microphone on. And, you know, part of that is a simple question. You, fo you, know, you focus in, uh, and, but a big thing, everyone speaks. So everyone should speak in your huddle meeting, your stand-up meeting, not in a wider kind of company briefing from, but in a team, everyone should speak. And you ask a kind of a, couple of standard questions there just to do kind of a sense check. Now, if you want, you can move that to every second day or something like that. But if you're not doing that now, and if people haven't gotten over the phobia of their camera, etc., you are in trouble, I think, in terms of your organization culture. Another thing we can do, which is really simple, is we have a, a pyramid of communication. And I would say, if you want to do one big improvement, just step everything up a level. So emails are not a communication tool. That is very important. At this stage, nobody reads emails. They scan emails. So I actually think that this business of just typing, now it might be the natural thing to do when you're not with somebody physically is to just send them an email. In the office, you might walk down and just, and, or you say, I'll bump into them. But I think you really kind of need to avoid email. And I'm just showing you there on the left, you can see the idea of this pyramid. And I think you just got to move things up a level um, in it. So in every one of those, as you move up a step, you pick up some more subtle nuances that is really important in communication. Remember, most uh, communication is actually nonverbal. So when you start moving up in that, you create, um, you, know, you create an extra dynamic, you, you create an innovation. And there are certain, by the way, brainstorming will not happen as well anywhere but face to face. The whole idea of just getting people around a whiteboard and, you know, kind of, uh, almost kind of, you know, embracing project failure is actually a big thing in, in, for innovation in projects. Um, 
The other thing is I'm a big believer in when you move to remote, certainly initially, you know, embrace simplicity. If you, you currently use 10 different reports or something like that for projects and simplify it, you know, folk drop it down to three to key, three even, or maybe five as a maximum key reports. And they all should be based on existing templates that people understand. So the type of stuff there that I'm thinking of is in terms of, you know, having maybe like a weekly progress report, a four week look ahead, what's in an in progress, slipping tasks, an action item for decisions. So I think keeping the documentation much simpler is probably a better way of doing it rather than, you know, keeping this kind of bureaucratic kind of heavy paper uh, driven environment. Now, the key to all this is transparency. So you have to have clear expectations from your from your remote team. So one of them might be the the, 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 the regular online attendance, microphone on, etc. I think you need to agree on a schedule for those meetings. What happens daily? What happens weekly? It's going to be different. And you can have a contingency plan in the event of technical difficulty. So just a very simple thing that I actually do is when I'm on an online meeting, I have the broadband obviously connected, but I actually tether my phone. So the idea of that is that if the broadband drops for 30 seconds, whatever it is, that my phone will pick up. So it just switches on to use my phone. So when the broadband comes back 30 seconds later, which is happening for whatever technical reason, but essentially I don't get disconnected or called back in again. So people have their own way of dealing with that, but that's something I do. So at this moment in time, if my broadband goes in the, in the house, it'll actually switch on to my mobile and you guys won't see any difference. So it's just a matter of just tethering. You're probably doing it all the time when you're out of the office, but just you can do it if there's an important meeting on. Um, okay, so that's a kind of contingency plan. Again, the whole empathy and flexibility. There are people who are looking after people who are cocooning, young children. We don't know what's going on. Some people have had, um, I suppose, just been dealt a horrendous hand from this uh, virus and some people have, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge is they, they can't get their hair done. So like it's a, so there are all sort of extremes in there. And I think, you know, if you're in a leadership position, show a bit of empathy in that space. Now, the other thing we have to do, and to be honest, this is, is back to Project Management 101, measure outputs, not ours. That's the essence of good PM. We are in the business of delivering work, not in clocking hours up. So, you know, ask, you know, is your team meeting deadlines, you know, um, are the team members delivering on an individual basis? And really important, are they supporting each other? I think that's really, really important, just back to that kind of fundamentals of measuring output, not ours. I mentioned email, and this is just my own theory in emails. And I honestly don't believe you should send an email anymore without having one of three words in the subject line. And that's action, document, or decision. So when you send somebody an email, now you bear in mind they're only going to scan read it anyway. Nobody reads a long email anymore, certainly if you're CC'd in it. So I always put the word action, document, or decision in front of it. So it's letting the person know when I send them the email, the action, it's required. This is a call to action. Or I'm sending them, this is a relevant document, which I may have attached it, or probably not in this day and age. I have it sitting on Microsoft OneDrive or Google Drive or whatever is your online document management system or decision. So I, that's just something I have adopted. And part of that, I actually learned from somebody else. They, they took on that they, when they send an email in their project environment, they send, they always put the word action in the subject. And I thought about it and said, well, you could extend that to document and decision. But again, I can't stress it's, it's enough. Email is not a collaboration tool. It is a nuisance at this day and age for most people. Now, there's some kind of ideas here in terms of developing that trust and teamwork. Now, some of these I thought about initially, um, I'm just gonna kind of not going to go through all of them, but you know, splitting large teams into smaller teams, that's a really simple way of getting more effectiveness in teams. Um, and I suppose the accountability must be very explicit. Um, the other thing you kind of hear, I suppose, in a lot of kind of US or American eyes, they talk about the water cooler I think in, in engineering uh, construction, we talk about the canteen or the coffee machine. And I think the idea of just maybe at 11 o'clock having a kind of an open Zoom meeting where uh, if somebody's stopping for a break for coffee, you don't know who they'll bump into. And I just think bringing the human back into projects, into work is something that we have to do. And again, it costs nothing to do that. So that, that's just some little 
issues there, I think, that you kind of have to look at how we can develop better trust and teamwork amongst people. Now, a colleague of mine has actually done a lot of research on this. So uh, in, in, I teach in TU Dublin, as I said. So a colleague of mine, Colin, he is actually, uh, he's, his whole PhD is on the basis of, you know, running virtual teams. Um, and I think he's looked at 50 different organizations around the world who are kind of moving to a more virtual space. And I suppose the key thing here, if I just kind of pop in to summarize, he's, they, these are the actual, the most important factors you know, trustworthy and trustworthy behaviors, communication and understanding the contextual factors. So, you know, trust is hard earned and easily lost, but this is actually an opportunity in terms of to develop trust in this remote working. So I would be asking again, if you almost think about, if you were to do up a whiteboard on a private meeting with your senior management and what, you know, and ask the question, what are we doing to let the employees know that they can trust us, that we have their back? Secondly, you know, our, our, our communication strategy. So a classic one you're seeing in this current climate, sometimes you ring a senior manager and you just can't get them on the phone. Now they're not physically in meetings with clients. And even if they're on a Zoom or a Microsoft Teams meeting, you know they can easy mute their, um, mute their camera or mute their, mute their mic and take your call for 30 seconds. So I'm amazed by that in this, that senior leadership, some people have actually really engaged, but some people have almost disappeared and that's a big issue, again, depending where you sit in the organization, you know, a great thing, you know, send out action email. Can you tell me, since the last eight weeks, how have you worked to develop trust within the people who report to you, improve communication to recognize we're online, and taken into account down the unique contextual factors that people are working? So that would be a hell of a, an email to send out. You'd have a lot of people busy on a Friday afternoon, I think, if you sent that. So some things are happening really well, and some things are happening not so well. So if we kind of look at this, just again, just as this is part of Colin's research here. And again, obviously Alva will give you all of these. He loves animation, I'm hammering away in the mouse here. So in this particular case here, I suppose there's two things to that. In our, it's the individual and the professional level or the individual and the team. So I think you should still be having, and uh, you should over communicate probably, if anything, you should be having those one-on-ones that, uh, with people at least once a week who report to you a private one-on-one, -on -one, uh, as well as your group meetings as well. So if that isn't happening, I think it's very easy for people to start disengaging. And again, the essence of all of this, don't micromanage. Um, that's probably the worst thing you can do. And by the way, I would say to you, I've had lots of conversations with people who uh, I don't work in the same organization with, and 100% Certainly uh, at the early days, you had people doing who normally did 40 hours a week were doing 80. They're putting a massive effort in moving back into, you know, delivering the same outputs, even though there's far more complications and adjusting to working online. So I don't think organizations have any fear in terms of people working as hard. I think they're actually working much harder. There are issues around burnout, to be honest with you, people working remotely. If you have that concern, let's be honest, you had a more fundamental issue that you should have addressed long ago. A few people who are not performing uh, remotely, they're probably going to do less, yes, but people who generally work hard, which is the vast majority of people in an organization, they are actually really stepping up to the plate, I think, across. So the last thing you want to be doing is, you know, if somebody asks you, think about yourself, and if somebody asks you, tell me, will you write me a list of everything you did last week? And you think to yourself, I knocked in 60 to 70 hours a week, and you're almost struggling to, uh, so it isn't that simple. You will have bad days. We all have had days where you kind of said, oh, I'm too, I'm too tired to even shower today. I worked so late last night, whatever it is. So I think, you know, don't uh, set people to have unrealistic uh, because there's a human factor. Everyone has unproductive days and sometimes we have highly productive days. My own opinion is people who are unproductive have, you know, conscious people who have unproductive days, they tend to work up. They, they self-manage themselves to deliver the same level in, in the organization. Amongst all of this, really importantly, you know, a lot of Engineers Ireland members, you're, you have clients and it isn't just about the staff. You have to reach out and communicate to your clients. So something that you could do, I think, is maybe just on a, on a Friday afternoon or Friday lunchtime or something, send an email out to your clients, somebody senior in the organization, letting them know in terms of what you're doing, uh, in terms of to support your staff, to support the projects they're delivering, et cetera. 
But I think in this, it isn't a matter of just battening down the hatches. It's about uh, looking outwards and showing your clients that you are a resilient project-based organization and you haven't forgotten about them. And you're, you know, as I said, the idea of actually reaching out to a client and say, your project has stopped for eight weeks. We've now been looking at this and we have a recovery strategy, how we can recover four weeks. We want to run, run through that with you or share wins as well. So I think there should be a an email once a week communication to your clients and probably to staff as well. And, and, you know, give people the credit for different things, share ideas people have, et cetera. Very simple one. Somebody said to me, they have a pair, they're working in an apartment with, with young toddlers, but they have a, uh, a noise cancelling headphones. So what they actually did was they wear those when they're working so they don't hear the kids in the background. So something as simple as that, people often go, oh yeah, I could, uh, I had that as well. So it's just amazing what's out there. And I suppose, again, just watching the time here, the whole area of uh, innovation. So a, a kind of, I suppose, slightly silly, but uh, virtual drinks on a Friday. You know, so I've seen people do that. And it sounds a bit corny, but... Uh, you know, you ain't going to be seeing a, a real pub for a while. So virtual drinks uh, might be that bad in terms of what's out there. Again, I'm just going to escalate it here a little bit, just watching the time. So I think it's back to this, you know, focusing on relationships. And I think that's part of your leaders to look at that. Um, and a big part of that is sharing. Come up with ways how you can share. Really important to keep an open mindset in all of this. So a forum for discussion. So I think a really good thing is, to ask people, you know, uh, five things that are working well for you working remotely, five things that need uh, improvement. One thing I'm amazed by is that lots of people who have like small little laptops and they're doing AutoCAD work or something like that, they're doing that from home and there's a massive monitor in their office. So like, you know, get that equipment, get your office chair, whatever it is, make that one trip, fill your car, take the stuff home and get yourself set up correctly. If you are doing that on your kitchen table or you're stuck for space, I do think it's really important you clear that stuff away at close of business and you actually almost kind of take five minutes to put the monitor away, et cetera, clear the kitchen table and just go back. Because if you do that on a regular basis, it, you, know, you become almost like sleeping in the office type of thing, which you definitely don't want. You're going to have to reassess roles in some cases. So I think that's part of just you need to look at certain roles may need to be reassessed. Again, depending on where this goes, and, and part of that too is maybe to have some sort of contingency um, for going forward. So again, I talked about uh, empowering rather than micromanaging. So you can actually see most successful organizations in the world, they, you know, the idea is you hire smart people and you get out of their way and let them get on with it. So the same should really happen remotely. Something I think is very important, and it's kind of coming more into engineering, construction, project managing, is the whole area of agile. Now, so I'm, I'm, I'm a reluctant convert to Agile. So if you asked me 10 years ago about Agile project management, I would have been of the view it's for people who can't uh, plan correctly. So certainly I see now we need a hybrid approach, but the distinction I make is between what I call uh, doing Agile and being Agile. Now doing Agile is really simple because you can just adopt the Kanban board or something like that. You're now doing Agile. But what I think is more important in the current time, and it's really part of that um, business continuity, uh, strategic readiness, is an agile mindset. And th these are the kind of values that I find you have to be asking yourself in an organization. You know, if you're an agile responsive, are you a greatest critic? Do, do you use the term continuous improvement in your meetings, in your discussions? And, um, you know, is, are we customer focused? You know, are we having you? Know, are you having these conversations prior to a client where you're kind of talking about don't tell them this or we'll tell them this or we'll cover this up? That's not good. If you're kind of almost having that positive, collaborative relationship with your client and a project, I think that's a sign of an agile mindset. Uh, again, and this is why it's really important: do we empower and trust our people? If you're asking people to send you a daily to do what you achieved today, I don't know is that really uh, the right thing to do? I think a more interactive in a Zoom call or a T Microsoft Teams call or whatever the case may be. And again, simplicity. How do we get from A to B to C and what talent and action do we need to make it happen? So almost that is, you know, in five simple steps, how do we transition to remote working or how do we develop a more hybrid approach to working, whether people are in the office or out of the office, that it shouldn't matter that much. And this is really important. Do we have a creative growth mindset? So are we kind of embracing this as a learning opportunity that it's a challenge? We know everyone's uh, 
under pressure, but we want to be in a better position than our competitors coming out of this. And you can't survey this. You can't ask this in a questionnaire. You know, it has to be evidence-based. You have to be able to see it, touch it, feel it in the organization. So surveys are probably the worst way to engage with people in the current climate. Pick up the phone or set up a Zoom meeting and ask people, how are you getting on? Don't ask them a multiple choice, you know, how are you coping with the, with the crisis from excellent to disaster? That's, that's not going to give you the answer. It's a more qualitative human interaction you should be having. Now, if there was one thing as somebody who's passionate about project management, I think this could be a chance to reinvent project management. And what I would love to see happening in these remote meetings, especially for complex projects or strategic projects, that we stop for a large complex project, stop looking only to the project team to deliver it, that the whole governance team or senior leadership support needs to support it. So everyone calls the project manager or the project team in, tell us your key milestones on how you're going to deliver to success. Imagine pulling in every senior director in your organization saying, you know, John or Mary is running a strategic project. How are you going to support them? So tell me how you're going to support that. It never happens. If you did that, it would have a massive impact on project success, successful project outcomes. And the organization, the business as usual, they benefit if your company makes, if that project team deliver and there's a high profit margin, the organization, everyone benefits. So functional, you know, heads of functions, heads of IT, HR, whatever it is, they all should be held accountable in terms of how are they going to contribute to success in project management. So that's one thing I would like to see coming out of this. The other thing we know, and it's not their fault, 70% of project sponsors are ineffective. That is going to become so obvious online. The project sponsor who does very little work or they've been assigned incorrectly, they haven't been trained or just, or they're so busy doing lots of good work in the organization in their functional area that they don't have time to support the project. So the whole area of project sponsor, I hope, will be looked at in terms of remote teams. The other thing too is we're kind of working blind in project management. If you look at PM in your organization, your capability mightn't have improved in the last 10 years. So something I think that you should do is you should do a maturity assessment. You assess your organization where it is in terms of project management. And one of the building blocks of your PM capability has to be now the ability to have a hybrid or a remote workforce. So that is now becoming a project management necessity and you should be assessing that as, as well as your everything from your decision making, your ability to manage scope, communications, et cetera. The other thing I think you should do as well in the terms of an opportunity to take stock, I'm a big believer in that you should have, there should be a fit between a project and a project team. So when you're out there tendering for work and you, you, know, you win projects, or you don't win them, but if you win two or three projects or you're trying to cherry pick projects, you should actually ask, you know, do a complexity assessment, look outwards in terms of the project and then do an inwards capability. Look at your own sort of what I would call project readiness. So look at it. Don't just look at it from a point of view. We tender for work. Look at the, the projects that suit you better in terms of your internal skill set. And that could be everything from previous relationships, working with people, etc. By the way, in terms of engineering, infrastructure, construction, how we assess complexity is the organization, the operational, technological, planning and management, the environment and the level of uncertainty. So that's a kind of a standard way how you can assess in, in infrastructure, engineering type projects, but you may need to come up with your own model as well. Ultimately, we are now sort of catapulting into industry 4.0, into triple constraint 4.0, and I think what we have to do here is we have to recognize that project management is no longer functional, tactical, it is strategic. If you want to foster innovation in your organization, you want to drive change and you want to support continuous improvement, you've got to put creative people and projects in the center. So for me, that's a big part going forward. Another way you could look at this is you could have a future back strategy. And let's actually imagine, you know, sit down in your strategic planning and plan for 12 months, three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, and actually look at how society might change your business model, et cetera, and actually start planning today. Look at things now and say, well, where are we? And if this happened in two years time, how would we, what would we need to do to be in a, in a more responsive manner if it happened again? And to be honest, I often think that it's, it's, it's almost a, uh, hypocritical for me as somebody working in academia to, um, to be talking about embracing change. I mean, the reality is, uh, you know, 
universities embrace change slightly quicker than the Vatican. We are the worst at change of all. So if you actually look at the university hall of the 250 years ago uh, and the workplace, so yes, it did prepare, but the scary thing is you look at the, uh, how education is delivered up to eight weeks ago, nothing had changed, yet the workforce has changed. So we've probably seen more transformation in the last eight weeks than we have in the previous 10 years in embracing online learning, et cetera. So it can be done even with a reluctant, reluctant bunch like academics. So certainly you guys as engineers, you can definitely do this. I'll conclude with those final immortal words of Clint Eastwood. Sometimes if you want to see a change for the better, you have to take things into your own hands. And I definitely think that is the case. This is an opportunity that you have to seize, but also not get caught up in the panic that you're, we are going to leave our homes again. You are not going to forever kind of live in this bubble. So I leave it at that. I went a little bit longer than I planned, unfortunately, but I'm going to hand over to Elvin. I'm sure she has lots of questions, etc. Thanks very much, John. Uh, that was really interesting. And um, we have over 200 people. Um, so I saw that uh, Sean McIntyre, he, um, he shared a link um, in the chat field there for people to, to have a look at. Um, but we might uh, take a few um, questions or discussion points in the chat field um, for people who'd like to Yeah, I like put to up that to there too, Elva. I thought this was something that I would just put up a question there. And I thought, again, as, a pro as project people who should be sharing and you know, part of the same membership organization, you see that natural kind of sharing happening uh, in coffee breaks when you're in uh, Clyde Road. But... So the, the question I would love to ask people is, you know, how are you going to re-engage with, with work when quarantine ends and what are your biggest concerns? And I know, um, you know, some organizations and professional bodies have sort of written recommendations to governments, et cetera, and they've shared, they've given you advice to their clients, et cetera. But I think that's, that certainly is a, is a big issue um, for people who are, who are going to go back to work on Tuesday. I think that's a, but I'm sure there are lots. I must have a look at the chats myself, but I'm going to stop sharing now so uh, I can have a look at the chats as well. Okay. Anyone to, okay, maybe if so, you can, you can unmute and ask the question if you like. Let me try and, um, okay, that's Sean's link. Um, so just there from Tara uh, here, advise uh, requirements for prioritizing projects when two prom two Many projects are due to be completed and 2020 and not enough resources uh, to do all. So, yeah, I mean, look, I think that is a fair point, but I mean, I mean, everything is going to have to be rescheduled and, and looked at. Um, the concern I have is in terms of all this, you know, even look at the whole housing investment that is supposed to happen. That money has been spent, etc. cetera. Um, I suppose one thing we've seen in the last recession is that, you know, turning off investment in infrastructure projects is a disaster that, you know, they give much better return uh, than anything. And we definitely don't want all this talent moving abroad um, like happened the last time. So certainly that is, that is a big issue. Um, so, so here's a comment. I've no interest in re-engaging ever again. Uh, uh, so somebody wants to be a hermit. Okay. So you're, you're, you're living the dream there. Yeah, you're probably, yeah, okay, you go for it, yeah. I think I'm somewhere in the middle, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I like the idea of hybrid working. Uh, I don't enjoy the rush hour commute, certainly. Um, and if I could reduce that one or two days a week, I'd be very happy to do so. John, going to pitch in there just a bit about the, um, sorry, Dennis Kelly from ESB, just talking really about getting back to work. It's a really, really interesting topic right now, you know. You made a very good point at the start of your session. You know, we literally bailed out in the lifeboats at the start of this COVID, uh, I suppose, isolation. Hmm. One thing most certainly we should be doing is not jumping back into lifeboats and rowing back to the ship. I think there's definitely, as project managers, we need to start planning now for a phase re-engagement. It goes back to the very good point you made about change management. To return to work is as much a change management exercise as the exit from work because we won't be returning to the, the same normal offices. We will, we will have to work in a different way. I think you hit the nail on the head. Hybrid working is going to be the norm from here on out. So I'd be really interested to hear what everybody else is doing, particularly on the return to work. Because in our sector, in the construction sector, 
return to work is very, 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 very close by. So a very interesting what other people are doing. Thanks very much. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Anyone jump in there, guys? I certainly think, sorry, Chris Fox here from Murphy's. Um, certainly think we were looking at uh, extending our offices, but it was going to be all completely open plan. Um, no, I'm not sure what the plan is now, but I can imagine a lot of people who are looking to build new offices will be reducing the amount of open plan they have because they can only limit a certain amount of people coming into the office then, unless they're going to let people work from home. But the, the new plan might be to actually put up more walls so they can get more people into smaller spaces. Yeah, that, that's. I think there's going to be a lot of design changes in buildings. Um, I think that is uh, that is an issue. Um, in terms of your own, I suppose what I think would be very interesting, certainly, that, you know, from from a strategic point of view, there will be office changes. But I think the the pre previous gentleman from the ESB, I think what what he's asking, and I and I think it's it's bang on the money, is what's happening out there. How how are you guys planning on doing this? So I suppose, you know, social distancing on construction sites, is that going to work? Well, I think at the, uh, this is John Jordan from AMA in Northern Ireland. Um, we're, we're a design office with over 100 staff. So we're trying to have to manage how do we get those people back in? And we're, we've actually just our, our director has just emailed us all this week with a survey asking us how we want to work in the future and have an input into it rather than just everyone saying, right, the office is open, everyone come back. Because that's just going to cause more problems. Um, but I know that certainly some of the construction sites that are still open in the north, they, they, they ha with over 300 people on site, they're, they're still having to sort of rewrite the rule book essentially and, and, and just try and work with the guidance that's out there and work with what best suits the site they're working in. Yeah, uh, my own thought in that too is I think we need to be very honest and, and no more than the government uh, on any country Sometimes you get it wrong before you get it right. And I, I honestly think that, you know, thinking you can just kind of write, write a document and it's going to be followed. Um, there's just a whole range of factors we haven't considered. Uh, even I know in the university I teach in where they planned everything, they suddenly realized, you know, toilets. Like you, you, yeah. you, if you, you, you can't have any more than one person in an eight person sort of a multi-person bathroom and there's 5,000 people in the building. Uh, so it's just, even if they get all the other stuff right, there, there's just going to be so many factors that we, we haven't considered, um, you know, uh, like queuing, they can't, like, a, they, you know, things you, I haven't even thought about because I'm not in a management function, but, you know, how people will actually access a lecture hall because there's going to be like, you know, 100 people coming out and 100 people walking in um, and they're all going to pass through that, as, you know, that, that square foot of space uh, in the doorway. Uh, so like there's uh, like, I, I think there's a multitude of factors that are out there that we haven't even considered yet. So it's going to be a, there's going to be a few bumps along the way. Definitely. Yeah. Anyone else share any kind of challenges or innovations or even take the view, would anyone share something that's working very well or not working so well for them? A lock on the office door is working very well for me, keeping the children out. Yeah, it. Um, yeah, it. Uh, you've. A, I think you have to explain this sometimes. You have a new boss, which is a two-year-old toddler, and. Uh, but yes, I, like, I've been on meetings where 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 I've seen people like, with everything from pets to young children, uh, sitting on their knee. And to be honest with you, I don't think it's such a bad thing that, within reason, obviously. But I think it actually gives you a certain empathy for what's going on in in other people's houses, etc. cetera. Um, so I think if you have teenagers, which I do, 13 and a 16 year old boy and girl who, who are at war constantly, um, that's a different challenge to having toddlers. Uh, and I just think, but, but the, the beauty I think is everyone accepts it. So now it's, it, it, it's fine. You know, people are attending meetings in their bedroom because it's the quietest place in the house, whereby that might've been so weird eight weeks ago. And now everyone gets it. So in, we are all in the same boat with different sort of challenges like that. John, Anyone there's, there's a, a question there uh, in the chat yeah. field from Jared Carr. So how do you think working from home will reflect our clients' perception? So 
clients calling to an empty office won't look well yet. What do you think? Will this also have an impact on larger companies? And I wonder, will client perspective be on data protection, projection and data being available in various people's homes? So that's, that's uh, well, I think that's a really interesting question. So suddenly GDPR is never being mentioned now. Um, and I would say every organization has breached GDPR in the last eight weeks to try and keep the unfortunate thing with these type of things is people have a short memory and I think in 12 months time, 18 months time, I think you're going to see um, the likes of GDPR and, and, and maybe even people getting a wrap in the knuckles for doing things that were absolutely necessary, necessary in the current climate. Uh, definitely the bigger your organisation, the more challenge you have. There's no doubt about that. Um, clients coming into offices, I don't think they're going to want it, to be honest with you, um, for a while anyway. Um, well, I think, you know, I think it's going to be a new normal, but I, there's no way in engineering construction you're going to, like, you, people physically have to, it's no different to it being a GP. You can't, you can't, like, physically examine people in the same way online, no matter what virtual reality headset you have or camera. And I think construction and engineering, and even those people in design offices, I think part of good design and engineering is you you go to site and you you meet the people who are going to implement the design, et cetera. You, you've got to have that. So, yes, I mean, if you're in a design, you can do more of that remotely um, than somebody who's maybe a site supervisor or something like that. But I still think you guys need to be on site as well or in, in or you should be. And that's that's a short term that you'll you'll work remotely 100 percent. I think you'll be back to whatever the. The norm is but the stuff you're doing in the office you might be doing at home but i think you will be required to to go to site to ensure good design good implementation of design john um yeah just jerk car here hi jer how are you yeah no what i was getting at there i suppose really is that like the data protection i presume that may have to be rolled back to a certain degree because it is a bit over the top and in the nature of our work whether you're sitting in a site with your laptop or you're sitting somewhere else, there's always a danger somebody can look over your shoulder and see what's on the screen. Um, I wouldn't be overly concerned about my own house here. It's just I noticed some clients of recent have been asking what precautions you take with data protection. And you know, you mightn't always have the answer. And it was just something that came, came across my mind um, from working from home, and particularly when you have people working for you working from home. Um, certainly most people, I think, will agree that you can get a lot more work done at home. and I don't know whether it's Engineers Ireland or who, who will have to push to maybe roll back the data protection to a certain degree. Um, obviously, sensitive information needs to be protected, but there's a lot of information there too that generally people just don't care if they see it or not. Yeah, there's an element. I think one of them is technology. I know in, in, in some places they've, they've incorporated what they call virtual VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure. And essentially, even when you're on your home PC, all the data is still stored in the office. So like if somebody stole your computer or anything like that, it's all virtual. So it, yes. the, the data physics, so that's one thing. But like you take, for example, um, you know, like I renewed my car insurance uh, about a month ago and I was chatting with the with the agent and uh, she told me she was working from home. So potentially all my personal details are on the on her screen on the kitchen table uh, and who, who knows is in the house. So there's no doubt that, that you know, that, that is a possibility and a very real one, but certainly I would agree with you that it does need to be rolled back or changed or certainly GDPR needs to recognize that there's a new normal. And I think what has actually happened is we're not hearing anything because people know that's a reality. But the concern I have, which I think is what you're alluding to, is you, you, people won't just, your data, uh, you know, when people look back at it, you know, hindsight, is always 2020 and they'll look back at it and say, well, you've reached the data rule. But the reality is, I suppose, if I, if, if I couldn't get my car insured, potentially I would have been, I could have been driving uninsured, which is a, a lesser evil than I think somebody seeing my data. But my concern is, you know, I, I think you're going to have, you're going to have challenges around that when things settle down a bit. So, Yes, it would be great to lobby in that, but I actually think it's going to be very difficult because it's a European yeah. initiative. So I think, you know, it, I certainly think maybe bodies like Engineers Ireland 
can collect that or analyze it and support members with the reality and maybe produce some stats to say like that in order to, you know, the, and almost put it on the table that there is challenges around data, but changing legislation is going to be impossible because it's European, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah. So it's just an interesting thing uh, here. So I won't call out the person's name because they sent it privately, but th this person said to me, we've had enormous leap forward in terms of modernizing our communications. The hope is it will continue along this path at a reasonable pace, so not a return to norm. So yeah, I, I think in fairness that that is the case, people's technology, et cetera, it has catapulted along. Uh, but I think this idea, I think it's that you will have the opportunity or the flexibility to, to work from home or work from different places, that there won't be that obsession with being in the office. Um, so yeah, I think that's good. Communications, et cetera, has dramatically improved. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's going to change, you know, it's not a 160 or 180 degree change we're going to see. I think it's going to be like a 45 degree. Things are going to re-pivot slightly. They're not going to transform completely, I think, in time anyway. Okay, anyone else want to jump in? Uh, so it's just somebody pointed out there, I Cara, see, as she's pointed out, the same issue is with the financial and banking sector. You ring up the bank now to query your account and there's a very good chance that customer service person is sharing a house with four or five flatmates and they're discussing your bank details I suppose when other people are uh, maybe doing their work as well so um, yeah I think uh, so just a comment here I see from P Cannon about Engineers Ireland will have the ability and responsibility to ensure change management is at the forefront of what we do while putting people's safety at front so yeah and, and in fairness I think that they do embrace that change. So I certainly remember reading papers about Engineers Ireland sending to the government when they're talking about uh, cutting infrastructure investment back in 2009, 10, 11. So I, I'm sure, and in fairness, there that does need working groups. You can't really, it takes time to collect that data and to, uh, to share it with people. Uh, good, great question here, send me privately, I think. Uh, do you think this period has changed the mindset of senior leadership and organizations in terms of flexible working? Or will there be a pushback to go to the norm when we can? Now, my view is it's temporary, but the difference is, so I don't think see, some of it has changed from senior leadership teams, uh, but I actually think um, the difference is if this continues for 12 months, that change, that temporary change will have become a habit. So I think, at this moment, if we get a kind of green light to go back to work, even in this phase four or five in August, and if everyone's back at work, I do think come, come January, I think 95% of us will be back working to the way we have. If it goes on for 12 to 18 months, I think that's, that's very different because that will become the normal then. But yeah, senior leadership, it's amazing, I suppose. Some people have been told you can never work from home, and then you're told that you know, 24 hours, you can do all your work from home. So it's amazing what we, uh, what we have to do. Uh, so just there, a comment there from Paula, uh, all, all, you know, as engineers, we have a responsibility to embrace and promote change and not waste the opportunity in the crisis. I, I think that is, and probably, I, I know this is only one of many initiatives that Engineers Ireland are doing, but probably, they're probably, if they haven't done so, is probably looking at the whole idea of collecting this kind of collective mindset or knowledge maybe surveying people to to grab some stuff might be worth doing um uh, so there just a comment there i think uh, again if it's privately i just won't call out someone's name um so i suppose there there's just a comment there on return to work it is important not to allow contractual issues to take your eye off the health and safety issues and i suppose absolutely that is something that has been a massive leap forward um in engineering constructions the health and safety so uh, you don't want that to um, certainly dissipate in any way. So another comment here. Um, uh, the exposure that senior management have had to new technology will have moved the needle in terms of rebase. Absolutely, will definitely contribute to it. Um, so there's just somebody here who's from the IT sector. Uh, uh, there's no shame in that. You're, you're, you're very welcome. So uh, all the challenges that are being mentioned around working from home distance sites, et cetera, can be solved with already uh, available technology. The construction manufacturing industry can learn a lot from the IT sector 
much of the change that's required, I think, is a mindset change from senior management companies. I think it is, but but the the bottom line is, you know, if you're developing code, you can produce the end product remotely in application. But if you're, you know, physically building a road or a building or a bridge, you know, that's the difference. That's the that's the bit that that is unique to engineering and construction. And I think that's I don't think there's any issue with the sort of design stuff happening from home, which is similar to IT, but I think it's more the physical. I live in Leakzip and Intel, I think, of over a thousand construction workers starting again on Tuesday. And I just say, how the hell are they going to manage that? Um, they're just, you know, construction sites are temporary uh, facilities. They're not set up. Uh, they're set up in a minimalistic kind of way. So how they're going to do that is, is incredibly difficult. Okay, so I, I'm just looking, we're gone over the time. So uh, unless there's any final comment, uh, anyone want to jump in with a final comment? Oh, I'm sorry, Chris yeah. Fox here again. Just the very last one there. Um, with regards to signatures on site, so people trying to sign for goods received, say, won't necessarily be able to do that anymore because they can't physically go up to the driver or take the docket from them unless they use a litter picker or something like that. But more importantly, toolbox talks and all the updated briefings that we would have been working on over the last while in regards to COVID-19, we can't get all the operatives together in one room. We get small bunches in a room or have them all outside but we can't bring them together to get them all to sign the briefing, the document sheet at the end to say that they received it because they'd all be coming to the same sheet of paper and that could be a cause of, uh, they could spread it from there. So we're just going to write their names on it. But in the coming months, if there's an accident on site and somebody hasn't physically put their own signature to say that they have a briefing, they could say, and if they had a very good lawyer, they could say, I was never given this briefing. That's not my signature. Has anybody else any issues like that or they thought of or how they would get around it. Anyone like to jump in on that? Hello, uh, we've had the same problem on a construction site and what we've, what I've come across and just implement my own site is there's a thing called Microsoft Forms and I'm just editing that to do it for Toolbox Talks but at the same time, Chris, I'm relying on the operative to sign it honestly but it's a form of a uh, you have to add in the C19 verification form, their number and their email address, and that's the way we're working around at the moment. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to... Uh, so you're essentially signing on behalf of someone, which is... Uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, no, like, there, there could be another six people in the area, and they'd all be witnesses, say, to the fact that that person was there, but... If this happens in a year's time, unless it's the six, the same five or six people every single time, they couldn't definitely remember that. Oh, Billy, actually, yeah, he was there at that toolbox talk. Yeah, I suppose. Is there any way you could um, get a recording by text message or a WhatsApp or like the Microsoft Forms is a is a free, but the only thing I suppose somebody pulling out a phone out of their pocket is different to sitting in front of a computer filling in a form. So um, yeah. You know, it's it's these are this is very difficult. Um, so I suppose to be honest with you, like it's it really the HSA has to answer these questions, um, and that's going to be the challenge again and again. They have to take legal advice and these things, etc. They have to look at legislation. So we we are in a complete minefield here, um, and certainly professional bodies, government agencies, etc. Um, I mean, you look at how difficult it has been to what would look like simple, like healthcare for, um, sorry, childcare for, for frontline uh, uh, healthcare workers. You see the disaster that has been. And again, I don't think, I don't think it's, a, it's a fault game or a blame game. It's just showing when you start dealing with people and risk and insurance and complex, how complex it all gets very quickly. And, uh, you know, I can't see you getting that answers quickly by the likes of the HSA or any government agency unfortunately you're going to have to kind of you know make 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 I suppose as best as you can reasonable decisions that you that you and th that you can try and defend in court if, if in need it happens but you're, you're all in the same boat in that I think any will we end on a more positive note anyone tell share their 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 their, their their best or worst uh, or funniest experience from working from home? Uh, 
But, well, it's um, uh, yeah. I was just going to say, um, one of the great experiences of working at home is that you get to do press ups every, you know, when you stand up from the desk, whereas you wouldn't be inclined to do that in the office. So, you know, from a health perspective, uh, great benefits to be got. I think I need to go to your webinar on that. I, I, I've gotten very lazy in the last two weeks. I was good up to then, but uh, Elva, I think you need to organize that one. Uh, physical <laughs> exercise for engineers or something, or remote, remote, remote gym, I think. You could be our Joe Wicks. <laughs> very good. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Uh, sorry, there was a lady I, wanted, I think you wanted to jump in there and, and, and make a, a final comment, was there? No, maybe that I, was I'm, me. That okay. was me. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass it over to you, so Elva, to wrap it up then. I will. I will. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, oh. It was a really good, insightful session. And thanks everyone for their participation and for their um, questions and comments. Are really interesting. So we could be. Uh, this could. We could uh, just talk all day. I'm sure. So um, again, thanks. The recording will be made available soon. And um, keep an eye out for our our courses and seminars and webinars um, online. We'll uh, hope to see you at some of those again. And um, take care, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Thank you very much.